Welcome back to the Nonprofit World TV show. I'd like to welcome our next guest, Laura Cortez. Laura, thank you for being with us. Thank Laura you, is the Executive Director of the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence. So welcome, Laura. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I wanted you to please share with our audience what does the Connecticut um, Alliance, or I call it for short, the Alliance, is that exactly. okay? Exactly. Uh, what does the Alliance do uh, for people in Connecticut? Sure. Um, thanks again for having me. Um, it's always um, really important to be able to talk about the issue and name the issue of sexual violence, and that's really the uh, focus of our organization, is ending sexual violence and providing high-quality, comprehensive, and culturally competent services to children, adolescents, and adult uh, victims and survivors throughout the state. Uh, we're a nonprofit that started in 1982 here in Connecticut, and really we are focused on ending sexual violence in, in three ways. Um, first is victim assistance and advocacy, and we do that through nine community-based sexual assault crisis service programs, or in the community you might know them as SACS programs or rape crisis centers. Um, also on the victim advocacy front, we are unique in that we have have 12 victim advocates that work within the state's sex offender probation and parole units and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that a little mm -hmm. later um, but we're really an organization um, when we're thinking about victim services that are setting standards and working to secure funding for victim services all throughout the state of Connecticut two hotlines, both toll-free in English and in Spanish, one of the only two states in the country to have a Spanish hotline. Mm. Uh, we do have a large Latino population in Connecticut, and we've been um, serving them with that hotline and services for nearly 20 years. Um, victim advocacy is important, also public policy. Um, so we're known for driving public policy efforts to secure rights for victims, to expand those rights, hold defenders accountable, and make sure that we're creating um, in every institution, in every community, compassionate responses to victims. And then the last thing that we're doing is prevention education and programming. And that means training folks on um, the front lines, uh, hospital staff, uh, police officers, um, folks within the criminal justice systems, as well as teachers mm -hmm. and parents and community members who um, really want to think more about not just responding to survivors' needs, which is important, but going upstream and ending sexual violence and preventing first-time perpetrator behavior. Well, that sounds like a, a tall order. Uh, so thank you so much for doing that important work. One thing that I wanted to ask, but I first want to make sure that I understand, uh, because probably our viewers will also want to understand, the nine uh, ra uh, centers mm -hmm. that are part of the alliance, are they independently run and they're part of this, uh, you know, the, the alliance uh, helps advocate on their behalf and helps make sure that the sort of the economy of scale in terms of hotlines and so forth are, are taken care of. Is that? Yeah. I think you described it well. There are nine individual community-based sexual assault crisis service programs. So mm -hmm. um, they are individual uh, rape crisis centers like the Milford Rape Crisis Center or mm -hmm. sometimes agency-based mm -hmm. like the sexual assault crisis service program of Hart New Hartford and New Britain okay. um, which serves the Farmington area mm -hmm. um, that's housed out of the YWCA of, uh, of New, New Britain. Britain right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we have um, other programs that, uh, again, standalone programs, and some programs that we support are also what's referred to as a dual agency, uh, like the Susan B. Anthony Project in Torrington, mm -hmm. which um, houses both a domestic violence program mm -hmm. um, from our sister coalition, CCADV, um, as well as a sexual assault program supported um, by the Alliance. Are there rape crisis centers in Connecticut that aren't part of the alliance? No. They're all part of yeah. it, so that's great to know. Yeah, so they all have the same standards mm -hmm. um, that we set um, and receive funding through the Department of Public Health, um, and then each member program has certified sexual assault crisis counselors that receive uh, initial and then ongoing uh, training, mm -hmm. um, and we are tasked with doing site visits and upholding those standards, um, especially around privileged communication mm -hmm. that all rape crisis counselors and sexual assault crisis counselors and advocates have uh, within our state. Great. Nobody plans to be the victim of sexual violence, so if somebody watching this uh, is a victim of sexual violence or knows of somebody who is, where's the first place they should turn? 
I would call a hotline. Mm -hmm. Our hotlines are not only toll free, but they're confidential. Mm -hmm. So um, the hotlines are there for victims and survivors. It doesn't matter if it happened a long time ago, if you've never told anyone mm -hmm. um, before, um, or if you're unsure. Mm -hmm. um, you can talk to an advocate. Um, you can also talk to an advocate if you're a parent, a partner, a loved one, a friend mm -hmm. of a survivor, because we have found over the years that um, supporting, we call them secondary victims, but uh, supporters of survivors also need time and space to talk through what they're feeling and to think through how they can support their friends. So at our each of our programs, we have adult advocates, child advocates, and programs and support groups, not only for victims and survivors, but also for their loved ones. The loved ones, um, I think I heard the term once, secondary survivor, mm -hmm. is that a yep. term that you recognize yep. as well? I thought that that was a really, interesting um, you know naming that as well because you know those individuals do experience quite a bit of trauma and also probably oftentimes don't know how to uh, address the actual victim of the physical violence as well so I think that's wonderful that you're doing that kind of work as well. I wanted to talk to you about a couple of national issues that definitely obviously ha um, have application in Connecticut. Uh, one thing that I've been reading about and uh, uh, hearing about on the media is uh, issues of rape kits and whether or not rape kits are destroyed after a certain time. Can you tell us about uh, the status of rape kits, um, you know, historic rape kits or ones that are, are existing and also, you know, if uh, I'm a victim of uh, sexual violence, would I be um, assured that my rape kit would, you know, be there and maintained so that when my perpetrator comes to trial, if I'm lucky enough, that that would be there. Can you tell us about that? Sure. I could talk at, at length because there's a lot to say mm -hmm. about how it is that we respond to sexual assault victims in the aftermath of an assault. Um, you've already used the word trauma. Mm -hmm. um, it's a traumatic event. Um, we know a lot more about how uh, trauma impacts uh, physically, uh, the neuroscience of trauma and what it's like just in the uh, minutes, uh, days after an assault. So for a victim to be able to have the strength to step forward and have evidence collected, um, which is a very invasive process, um, is, is very difficult. So um, we want to make sure that there are systems to uh, ensure that evidence is collected properly, but that it's also tested. So that we're looking at, now we, that we have the capability to do DNA testing, um, that we're um, following through on that commitment to victims. Connecticut was actually one of the uh, first states to set standards for the collection of evidence to make sure that we weren't billing victims. Um, there are still parts of the country um, where victims are billed for wow. um, having evidence. And no other crime can mm -hmm. you think of where uh, right. the collection of evidence of a victim of a crime is paying for mm -hmm. it. Um, but because it's such a unique crime that the evidence is on the person, mm -hmm. um, we were battling that um, in mm -hmm. places around the country. Mm -hmm. But in Connecticut, uh, we were very thoughtful about that going back 20 years. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the most recent challenges that you mentioned was, okay, what's happening with those kids? So um, through uh, the Alliance and through something called the Evidence Commission, has a longer name, but I'll leave it at that for <laughs> the state of Connecticut, um, that sets the guidelines around the collection of evidence, we uh, started to think uh, critically about our state and if there were any untested kits mm -hmm. um, because we have had um, a multidisciplinary approach, having police pick up the kits from the hospital um, and take them to the crime lab. In Connecticut, we're very also, you know, small state, but we only have one crime lab. So it's very clear on where uh, these kits should be going. But in uh, the end of 2014, early 2015, uh, we coordinated a survey of all the police departments in the state of Connecticut. Um, and I'm happy to say there was, uh, without having to pass a law to get this information, um, nearly all the uh, PDs participated. Um, unfortunately, we identified nearly 900 sexual assault evidence collection kits, some um, over five years old, almost 40% over five years old that had never been sent to the lab for testing. So um, our organization at the time, um, we did a report um, pulling that data together mm -hmm. and um, asking for a couple of things. One, we wanted to make sure that there were clear time frames for the transfer and the testing of evidence from these kits, as well as securing the funding to test 
the cats mm -hmm. um, and change the law going forward to make sure this would never be a problem again. We know um, that testing a kit can corroborate a victim's story, mm -hmm. um, could identify serial rapist, mm -hmm. um, could you know certainly um, remove um, the suspicion of an individual as well. Um, but we owe it to victims who um, imagine their evidence uh, being used to successfully prosecute a rapist um, to get these kits tested. So through our advocacy, we asked the governor to create a sexual assault kit working group. The state of Connecticut also secured funds. Um, so now we have nearly um, 800 of those kits that we identified at the crime lab. Mm -hmm. They've started to test and the governor created a sexual assault kit working group which I chair and we have been meeting, uh, we started meeting this year and we um, just recently uh, created a victim notification protocol group um, so we can start to think about how to support victims whose cases may have DNA hits mm -hmm. and whose cases may be reopened. Mm -hmm. And we have to have great sensitivity to think about what that looks like sure. when you call or contact someone five, seven years uh, later. Uh, about That's a, traumatic in itself, yeah. right? Um, they may have moved on, they may have been waiting. Mm. Um, and so that's going to bring up a lot and whether or not they're going to go through with maybe what may be a very lengthy court case. Sure. You spoke a little bit about the funding wasn't there and that's something that your commission and the governor and the state is mm -hmm. doing. How was that done before? Yeah. Was uh, were so, certain towns had the funding and others no, didn't? So it's not, mm -hmm. the funding is actually through the crime lab. So mm -hmm. if the crime lab would have had the kits, they would mm -hmm. have tested them. Okay. But because, so um, we, the state of Connecticut and um, our advocates, one of the things that we do is we're on the front line, so we will respond to a hospital call. Uh, nearly 500 hospital calls in a year. Mm. So every day, yes. a, a few times a day around the state, we're responding to So you can have an evidence collection kit done um, within five days. Mm -hmm. They can, um, even on the fourth day, they can still have evidence that could be valuable in a case. So we're there to support victims um, and help them um, in the next steps. And in Connecticut, one of the um, really good things that we do is also provide victims an opportunity to have it collected anonymously. Mm -hmm. So in uh, so they understand this evidence could be lost, but maybe they're unsure about reporting at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. uh, victims face um, a lot of uh, undue shame, blame, and guilt mm -hmm. um, in the aftermath of a sexual assault. Yes. So we want to allow them that time. Mm -hmm. So we, when we were looking at the numbers, we somewhat imagined that the kits that would be at the police departments would be the anonymous kits. But it turned out there were only about 10% of those kits that were anonymous. But mm -hmm. in any given year, um, you know, the crime lab is doing about 400 kits. So what we're saying is in addition to about 400 kits, you're having uh, about 900 come through you know, in a year. So that uh, additional dollars were needed. So the state applied mm -hmm. and we were one of 20 sites in the country to receive uh, what's called a Sexual Assault Kit Initiative or mm -hmm. SACI grant mm -hmm. from the Bureau of Justice and Administration. Oh. So um, there are cities that receive that, mm -hmm. but we took this on statewide. Yeah. So we're in the first year of that. So mm -hmm. the funding, it cost about $1,000, $1,200 mm -hmm. uh, to test a rape kit. So um, those dollars dollars um, are really important. Some cities have had to make hard decisions about which kits to test. Yes. And the, here, here's the thing that I think is so important for folks to know, and one of the things that we've realized was happening before, um, a lot of people assume that uh, people who commit sexual assaults are strangers. And we know that the overwhelming number of offenders know their victims. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they use that relationship. Oh, you're my brother's sister or a mm -hmm. colleague or a neighbor um, to manipulate and, and right. coerce, mm -hmm. or I'm a teacher or mm -hmm. a coach. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things that um, we have identified as one of the reasons kids didn't go forward is that people assumed that, oh, we knew who the offender was. So if I say, uh, this individual assaulted me, the police may say, well, I talked to that individual and he said it was, con uh, he was with the, it was consensual. And so why would we move the kit forward to identify it? Well, here's the shift and yes. what we know now is that offenders do this over and over again until such time as there's 
yes. uh, you know, an intervention, yes. or somebody um, is um, called to account uh, for their crime. So now we know mm -hmm. that that DNA evidence, mm. um, the value of going back, right. is that even if a victim doesn't come forward, even mm -hmm. if it doesn't warrant opening the case, right. that's in a DNA database. Mm -hmm. So we can start to connect the dots, and that's mm -hmm. what we've seen across the country mm -hmm. in cities like Houston and Detroit. So not only are they mm -hmm. providing justice uh, long overdue for victims, mm -hmm. but they are identifying serial rapists. So we expect to see some of those uh, same results in Connecticut. So instead of just relying on the he said, she said, and ending it there, look at the evidence and have that, you know, that that evidence tested and, and have that available. And, and like you said, um, and if it's connecting to exactly, other cases, exactly. um, maybe mm -hmm. we would say that warrants um, further sure. investigation and, um, you know, reopening that case. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you a little bit more as well on another national topic. And I think uh, you brought up, uh, which is really important for people to understand that victims of sexual violence do, uh, you know, often get blamed, shamed, there's guilt associated with it. Uh, you, you know, many, many times people who come forward, uh, you know, they face the reaction of, well, why didn't you come forward sooner if they, you know, if there's any kind of delay. We certainly have seen that um, in the national news with uh, one of the individuals that was running for uh, uh, campaigning for president. Uh, and uh, one of the things that disturbed me in the media um, treatment of that was that oftentimes they were uh, media, uh, members of the media were saying that uh, what this individual had, who already admitted uh, on tape uh, to doing, uh, which was sexual assault, they were characterizing it as sexual harassment. What does the Alliance do um, to help educate people between the differences of something that's sexual harassment versus unwanted physical contact of a se uh, sexual nature, which is sexual assault? Well, when we're out talking about sexual assault uh, day in and day out, so whether that's at policy tables or in the classroom, um, letting people know about consent, mm -hmm. um, bodily autonomy, which starts at an early age. And um, if I may, <laughs> just let your audience know yes, that um, this fall, mm -hmm. Connecticut became one of a handful of states to now require age-appropriate K through 12 sexual assault um, and abuse prevention education programming um, in all of our schools. Wow. So the school districts, of course, are deciding on the curriculum, mm -hmm. but uh, the Alliance work with the State Department of Education and DCF to come up with a framework and mm -hmm. new guidelines. Mm -hmm. Those uh, you can find on our website, mm -hmm. um, but I encourage uh, folks in the audience to really think about their school districts and make sure that's happening. But when we start at an early age and name it, mm -hmm. um, it really empowers people to um, be able to um, prevent sexual violence um, the, I should say, prevent the perpetration of sexual mm -hmm. violence. Because you and I grew up in a generation where uh, we kind of confused risk reduction with prevention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So prevention says we're going to um, actually prevent it before it starts. So mm -hmm. we'll raise a generation of people that choose not to sexually harm other individuals mm -hmm. versus thinking about, oh, what I could do, um, you know, to walk with a buddy or um, cover my drink. Those are all messages that... Um, at the end of the day may reduce risk, but doesn't keep that individual from coercing, manipulating, or harming um, and, and choosing to sexually assault someone else. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the dialogue about sexual assault, but one of the things, Donna, that mm -hmm. I want to go back to that you said yes. is this national dialogue right. that we're having. Right. We've only really been talking about sexual assault uh, for 40 years mm -hmm. in this country, and I would say in the last couple of years, we've had reason to have enormous hope because we've been talking about sexual assault violence in a way that we never have before. Mm -hmm. At our highest levels of government, mm -hmm. we had the President of the United States um, launch a campaign looking at women and girls and the high rates of sexual assault. Um, we've uh, specifically focused on federal law on college campuses. Um, we also have uh, done great work here in our state, but what I mean by that dialogue is that we're actually um, naming it. Mm -hmm. So there is a difference between uh, sexual harassment right. and, and sexual assault. Mm -hmm. I would say they are on a continuum sure. of, of sexual violence mm -hmm. um, where we want to start um, at an early age, as I mentioned. But I would say there's a shift. Um, and I, I want to say two things. One mm -hmm. is that so much of this change has been driven by 
survivors and victims and advocates and the larger set of community uh, partners that are calling out victim blaming, mm -hmm. defining rape culture that includes that victim blaming component, um, lacks accountability for offenders, and I've seen that shift. Mm -hmm. The election cycle um, was uh, has been just very painful, yes. and um, it's also cer certainly fresh. We're a nonpartisan organization, but mm -hmm. the when you're talking about uh, sec when there are sexist comments, racist comments, xenophobic comments, um, we have a great sensitivity to thinking about the safety needs of sexual assault victims. And when sexual assault victims um, brave coming forward and are met with um, threats of retaliation, that really silences um, right. victims and um, what impacts their ability to think about uh, coming forward. It's triggering for victims mm -hmm. who've come out before mm -hmm. or who consider coming out mm -hmm. um, and knowing that there may be uh, folks that would scrutinize or mm -hmm. shame or blame them. Mm -hmm. So the dialogue that we've been having through the, or what's been raised through the election I think we have real reason to be concerned. Mm -hmm. um, and I also say the concern for uh, LGBT community, people of color, people with disabilities, and immigrants. And we think about ending sexual violence in the uh, in the context of ending all oppressions. Mm -hmm. We know that historically, and um, I should say currently marginalized communities mm -hmm. are at higher risk and really experience sexual violence um, at higher uh, rates. And so when we're thinking about ending sexual violence, we have to think about services and supports for everyone and also about the attitudes and behaviors that would diminish any Connecticut resident. So mm -hmm. in the last uh, few weeks, we've been thinking about our work and how we can deepen um, relationships and supports um, for every Connecticut resident. Um, while we do have statewide services, I think um, what comes next in terms of how people talk about rape and sexual assault, um, we really want to be able uh, to deepen uh, prevention efforts as well as supports for survivors. Because this is a wonderful opportunity to do even more of that education, mm -hmm. Absolutely. outreach, and hopefully um, create a climate where more victims will come forward and also that we will end more sexual violence by um, education. Mm -hmm. Speaking of uh, ending sexual violence and preventing it, uh, it's interesting that your organization also interacts with perpetrators. Uh, yeah. You mentioned it a little bit at the start. I'd like to get you to tell us a little bit more about what the Alliance does uh, with regard to perpetrators. Sure. So. <laughs> Sex offenders or people who commit sex crimes, um, they are our brothers, fathers, school teachers, people in our community. Um, and I think, again, to reference my generation and messages that we got, uh, we had growing up is there are certainly um, sadistic uh, individuals, um, there are certainly pedophiles, but in between there are folks that harm and so what's going to happen to them if um, they go through the criminal justice system is they will eventually uh, be released or they will go directly on probation or parole if mm -hmm. um, if that if it goes that even that far and so we are thinking about um, individuals who harmed others back out in the community and what are they receiving for treatment so they don't harm again. Sure. So that's an interesting place for us to interact mm -hmm. and say, um, what do we need to be doing? We want, um, and then with scarce resources, so mm -hmm. we want victim services, but we also need to think about uh, what's happening with offenders to make sure that they in the community never harm again. Mm -hmm. So the state of Connecticut has a uh, unique model mm -hmm. on probation and parole. So they have specialized units for any person who's committed a sex offense. Um, they come out on probation or parole in a specialized sex offender unit. And there's a multidisciplinary um, or I should, uh, approach to thinking about um, these cases. And we have a dozen victim advocates that work throughout the state on these units. And when someone is released into the community or comes back in, we serve to support that victim, the survivor, their family, mm -hmm. to say this individual that harmed you was uh, released. Mm -hmm. What are your needs? Right. Here's where they're going to be. Right. Um, here's, um, you know, and, and family situations come up, mm -hmm. right? So a uh, family member, because uh, so many times the offender is in an, uh, a family. larger family sure. mm -hmm. or um, that a community, let's say, they attend the same church. Mm. So maybe we help uh, one of the needs for the victim is their safety. 
maybe the, uh, we work to have the individual find another place to worship, or there's a funeral. Um, what are the victim's needs? And without a victim advocate there, mm -hmm. I think we kind of lose sight of um, their right to safety and peace of mind, mm -hmm. as well as then think about the accountability for that offender. Mm -hmm. um, the offenders are required to go to uh, treatment groups mm -hmm. um, and have um, some set of approval around the, um, we'll call them social supports people. So mm -hmm. our victim advocates are also thinking not only about safety planning and the needs of the victim and survivor, mm -hmm. but also about who's involved in the offender's life and mm -hmm. how can we make sure that they have the strength um, and the knowledge about supporting that individual so they can be them best selves and, mm -hmm. and not offend again. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a model that um, we uh, have throughout our state since 2007. Um, and we've seen it replicated in a couple other cities, but it's really unique to Connecticut. And again, you know, we don't know um, too much about uh, the recidivism rates of offenders, but we think they might be lower in Connecticut from the studies that we've seen because of this collaborative model. Mm, that's wonderful. It sounds to me, uh, not sounds to me, you and I spoke a little bit before mm -hmm. uh, the show about a special event you have coming at the Governor's Mansion on December 1st. Uh, do you want to tell me a little bit about the theme of that and where, where um, you know, website address so oh, sure. people can find out more? So uh, reference the website, it's End Sexual Violence CT. Um, and for folks who uh, may not know, we actually changed our name uh, a year ago. F folks may have known us as Connecticut Sexual Assault Crisis Services. Um, and we changed the name to be very specific and intentional about what we do, that we want to end sexual violence. Mm -hmm. So endsexualviolencect.org. Okay. Um, you can find information about a holiday reception, mm -hmm. and it's really just a festive uh, reception, two-hour reception. Mm -hmm. You can find more information December 1st on our website to support the uh, work that we do um, on the front lines helping survivors. You can also find more about education uh, training programs, mm -hmm. both for your community group or um, if um, you're a professional and you have colleagues that you think want to uh, learn more about how to receive a disclosure closure mm -hmm. and support survivors. Um, we provide training uh, many times at no cost uh, to folks around the state. You can find your local program as well by going to our website. Um, we serve every corner of the state and there's a program and an advocate that wants to work with folks. So mm -hmm. endsexualviolencect.org. Laura, I think uh, from what I've heard, I am confident that uh, Connecticut is really a uh, a leader in the country uh, in this work, and I think that's thanks to you and uh, the Alliance. So thank you so much for joining us on the show and telling us more, and good luck with your event in December. Thank you, Donna. Sure. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this episode of the Nonprofit World TV Show. We'll see you again soon. Thank you to our producer, Sarah DeGraff. I'm your host, Donna Hagigat. Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence is a state's coalition of nine community-based sexual assault crisis service programs. We support survivors and we work to end sexual violence. We do this through victim and survivor support services, public policy advocacy, and prevention, education, and training programs. The nine member programs of Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence provide free and confidential services to victims and survivors of sexual assault with a focus on support and empowerment. Hi, I'm Liz Hal Mattingly. I'm the volunteer coordinator for the Sexual Assault Crisis Service of the YWC New Britain, and we are one of the nine member centers in Connecticut that provide services to survivors of sexual violence and their loved ones. Some of these services include our 24 hour confidential hotline, which is available in English and in Spanish, with immediate access to trained certified counselors. We also offer short-term crisis counseling in person, which is also free and confidential. 
We offer advocacy and accompaniment through hospital, police, or court procedures, which means that an advocate can go with you if you go to the emergency room or the police department to give a statement or through the courthouse. We also have a variety of support groups. We can offer uh, community education or prevention education programs. And we also have a counselor advocate training program for those who are interested in volunteering as well. I do this work because I would like for my daughter to grow up in a different world. I do this work because I'm committed to making a change in this world. Our Alliance advocates for victims and survivors as individuals, as well as participating in collaborative advocacy efforts at the national, state, and local levels. I'm an advocate because I care. I'm an advocate to be a voice to those who don't have one. I am an advocate because it's never the survivor's fault. I like being an advocate because I get to empower and give the victims their choice back. Sexual violence is not inevitable. We seek to end sexual violence in our society through primary prevention by identifying and taking action against the factors that cause and support the perpetration of sexual violence. Even if it happened a long time ago, even if you knew and trusted the person, even if you never told anyone, we can help you now. Because at Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence, we believe you. I believe you. I believe you. Soy una defensora y yo te creo. I believe you. 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 We believe you. We believe you.